Hello everyone, welcome to this episode of Cleocast. It's episode 3, The Battle of the Hampton Roads. We're going to be talking about the Battle of the Hampton Roads and also the Civil War in general, which is always a fun topic. Don't you agree? Yes. Did you guys know that boats used to be made out of wood? Well, we're going to see the moment where that completely just disappeared. Can you imagine a wooden boat? Like, who even uses wood nowadays? I don't like splinters, and neither do the people on the Minnesota. Yep. What are we doing? <laughs> this is going in. You have to figure out something to talk about, Matt. It's going in. <laughs> so, I hope you guys like long gaps. All right, so, the Civil War. America had slaves for a while, and that was bad. But there was a bunch of rich dudes who owned them, and you know how money works. Look at any modern politics. Clearly, we don't, you know pay to have our laws adjusted in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. So there was a bunch of compromises to be able to maintain slavery. And at the same time, there were a bunch of weird dudes who enlisted in the Navy at the ages of 13, 14, or 15, sailing around the oceans, whipping each other, and getting drunk, including Commodore Matthew Perry, who opened up Japan. This is very crucial because it created a small, but I'd be a very competent, naval officer corps which was its own clique completely different from the united states army at the time during pre-civil war united states and american politics in general during the time it was hard to understand navy guys and it's hard to understand them now too but they don't have you know riggings it's just a whole different you know culture when your sailings are going to take multiple months and you actively have to be you know changing the sails and swabbing the decks and stuff just modern naval forces just aren't really the same you know where it's like oh just turn the engine on you know we got ac we got lights we got a gps it's it's just an entirely different experience that isn't really comparable to much else today now when engines were first being put into ships they were on the side they were big paddle wheel imagine one of those old timey river boats that's what most of the navy ships that were out in the ocean that had engines were doing and they were steam powered powered by coal now those engines were extremely inefficient and those paddle wheels made them very susceptible to attack now there is one man He was born in Sweden, and he lived as an officer for a while in the Swedish army until he got a furlough to go to London to pursue an idea of an engine that wasn't ran like a steam engine, but ran off of the heat of slow, high-burning wood found in Sweden. And his name was John Erickson. The thing about this story is, much like the Civil War as a whole, there's a lot of individual actors that are really important to understanding how it works like there's a lot of individuals that made this whole battle and the whole ironclad thing come to fruition and you kind of have to get to know each of the individuals to really understand how it all shaped up the way it did so that's how we're going to start today john erickson a swede who had a knack for engineering and a craze for machines joined the swedish army as an officer he did very little in his military career and eventually sought a furlough from the king of Sweden to go explore his engine which he had just designed which ran off of heat not off of steam through burning Swedish wood to reinvent the idea of engines. He brought that to England to demonstrate his idea in the hopes that it would catch on but when it burned English coal it did not but a man by the name of James Watts praised Ericsson for his engine design, the man who invented the steam engine praising another man who invented his heat engine. John Ericsson would hold a grudge against the idea of his engine not being used, but the idea of a railroad craze took John Ericsson. An open contest to design one of the first railroad engines to be used in England was offered to have a grand prize. John Erickson figured out about the contest late and quickly took his new engine design, which was denied from inventors and entrepreneurs as a bad idea, and designed a railroad engine that was able to produce 
a lot of power. The only issue is it suffered mechanical issues, which was why he never got the contract. But if we saw him getting the contract, we might have seen a completely different world in railroad engineering. John Erickson, after being snubbed from two different events with his special heat-powered engine, never gave up on this engine and would hold on to it for the rest of his life, considering it one of his greatest inventions. But after being snubbed on the land, John Erickson looked to the sea. Across that sea which John Erickson looks lays another man who would be crucial to the story of the Battle of Hampton Roads. Gideon Wells was born in 1802 in Glastonbury, Connecticut. From a young age, he wanted to be a writer, but he didn't really get to achieve that dream. He joined the Democratic Party when it was founded by Jackson. President Andrew Jackson then appointed him to be postmaster of Hartford, Connecticut, once the position opened. This spoke to Gideon. He always enjoyed being postmaster. He had a keen sense of logistics. So he got married you know, Andrew Jackson moved on, and around 1844, the much older Gideon Wells went to James K. Polk, the new president at the time, and requested another postmastership because he wanted to offer his services. The problem was the postmastership at the time was already occupied, but James K. Polk, you know, looking at this you know, older figure who had been in the Democratic Party since its inception was like, hey, you know, we might need this guy. So he gave him the only position that was open at the time, which was as a logistics master in the Navy. The Mexican-American War was happening at the time, and Gideon found the job quite amusing, you know, trying to find out how to get blankets and stuff all the way down to Mexico for these soldiers who were fighting conditions they had never had to fight in before. Eventually, though, the Mexican-American War had to come to an end, and with it, soon after James K. Polk's presidency did as well. Gideon found himself out of a job once again, but a few years later, uh, Abraham Lincoln would take power, and he was in a very tumultuous period in American history. He had a lot of you know talk of secession upon his ascendancy to the presidency, and even though Gideon was a Democrat, he was very experienced in naval logistics, and he was a figure who was not quite pro-slavery. He wasn't entirely against it, but he wasn't really for it. So he was a figure that Lincoln could bring into the fold to kind of try to show that he wasn't just, you know, entirely opposed to everything. You know, he was, he was a conciliatory figure to be brought in. A large part of the reason for Wells' belief is even though he was a Democrat, he was also from Connecticut. So he was definitely a northern boy. You know, he wasn't exactly some... Dixie loving, you know, Southerner as they go. So Wells was brought into this position right at, you know, the beginning of it all, and he found the Navy had been severely depleted since his time, as there had not really been any major conflicts. In fact, the entire Navy was 90 ships in total, with only 24 of them having any form of steam power. So all of a sudden, he's in this new position, he's in charge, and this man who has no idea how to requisition ships, you know, the Mexican-American War, he'd been requisitioning blankets, suddenly has to completely rehabilitate and reconstruct this naval force. As the realities of the situation began to set in, Gideon started drawing ships from wherever he could. This new naval force began to get a nickname, the Soapbox Navy, derisively pointing out how it was not exactly the you know greatest fleet ever assembled, but it started to get the job done. It established a Union naval presence off of southern waters and showed that they were in fact there to stay and they were in fact not going to give in immediately. With the construction of these new naval ships, Gideon soon ran into a problem, which was that of a kind of abrasiveness towards innovation. See, there had been an event some 20 years before that had really kind of soured the Navy on taking on new ideas. But with the construction of all these new ships, that was exactly what Gideon was looking for. John Erickson, fed up with the treatment that he received in England, decided to cross the ocean and give his try at American engineering and American ingenuity. John Erickson is arguably the first person to invent the propeller-driven ship, 
also known as screw ships at the time due to the shape of it being a screw instead of a uh, paddle. John Erickson took that design and modern conventional steam engines because his previous engine was frowned upon by most everyone in the public to develop a ship with the Commodore Stockton of the United States Navy in the uh, late 1840s. This ship, dubbed the Princeton, named after Commodore Stockton's home state of New Jersey and the college in which he would then attend uh, as Commodore Stockton was a young man, Erickson designed one of the best naval ships of the time. But the gun, known as the Peacemaker, was something that Commodore Stockton dreamed up, which went against the design of Erickson. Erickson protested against the idea of such a large firearm aboard the ship as it did not follow the idea of Dahlgren guns, which were a major naval innovation the United States had. It was instead Stockton's design. Erickson, also an egomaniac, did not like anyone using other designs other than Erickson designs on his ships. But Commodore Stockton continued, taking the Princeton and the Peacemaker along on a great tour to eventually bring it down to Washington, D.C., where President Tyler witnessed the gun be demonstrated. It shot and made a loud explosion, rattling windows throughout D.C. and awing the people on board. They then went down to the lower decks of the Princeton to enjoy a nice meal, but some state senators begged Commodore Stockton to demonstrate the gun again. They loaded and Commodore Stockton pulled the cord, and all he felt was a loud concussion. The hats flew. Common of the day for top hats to be worn were now sitting in the water, and soon the screams then came by. President Tyler, with those below deck, heard the screams, thinking it was celebration and such glory of how great the United States could be to develop such a fantastic weapon. But little did they know that it had killed. Commodore Stockton, in panic to cover his ass, decided to blame it all on Erickson, destroying Erickson's reputations in the public and naval eyes, and also destroying the ideas and innovations that Erickson was so gladly pushing for. This pushed back the United States Navy drastically, where they then ditched the idea of propeller crafts and the ideas of steam-powered locomoting that Erickson pushed for. But Gideon Wells needs ironclads because there is rumors coming up from the newly seceded state of Virginia stating that the former U.S. flagship Merrimack was being turned into a slave-driving, Confederate-loving monstrosity that could destroy the Union itself. That's it for this episode. So go ahead and join us next time as we talk about industrialists, the Confederacy, and just how difficult it is to build a metal boat.